Hello everyone, um, thank you for attending today's session. We're just about to kick start. I hope all of you had a great lunch and a great keynote or lock note. Um, so today in this session we have Ariane joining us and he will be talking about system thinking and event-driven architecture. Um, before we do that, a quick bio about Ariane. Having started as a teenager in IT, Ariane has a vast experience in every aspect of the life cycle of software development. Enterprise architect, front or back end developer, agile coach, product owner, any hat is still being put on those gray hairs. Um, with this background, he's perfectly placed to talk about how to make all these aspects work well together. And this is what he will be talking about today. So please join me in welcoming Ariane, everyone. Thanks, everybody. Let's kick right in. Uh, it's going to be an extreme challenge for me to talk after a storyteller like our space specialist, but I will give it a go. Um, I'm here to talk about one of the biggest problems that we have in IT software development in general, and that will be the gap between business architecture and project implementation. How do we bridge the gap that what business wants is delivered by us? And first of all, I thought, is business architecture actually the right term? Does business architecture exist? I think IT already took over business architecture when they invented enterprise architecture, because then they started to talk and tell business what they should be doing and how they could get their information and we kept all the control. So I don't think there is really something like business architecture. I think the best way to describe business architecture is probably to look at strategic initiatives. Yeah? Businesses have a vision and they translate it into, okay, how can we achieve those, init, those visions? And what does operations need to do to get there? So, next problem. Strategic initiatives almost always fail. Why is it the problem that the initiative is wrong? Or that we don't think about the real scope of an initiative? Yeah? Because, in reality, the initiative itself is not the problem. Yeah? They want to achieve something. We should be servicing the business in helping them to achieve what they want. So, no, the initiative is not the problem. So, what's left? What is the real problem in IT for years and years? And the problem is that we have different types of organizations. We have mature organizations that are perfectly able to say, we have a vision, that means we have this goal, that means that we need this strategy, which should produce this outcome, which we link back to the goal, and if we have this strategy, then perfect. Yep, we're back online we have the outputs that actually provide the outcome that we're looking for. The reality, however, is slightly different. The reality of a typical organization is that we have a mission. Then the uh, whole time nothing. And then we say, okay, the CEO has a vision. He knows how to get there. How are we going to drive this mission? And that means you guys have a goal, save 4% in cost, done, easy. Then strategy, strategy just thinks, okay, how can we get our KPIs? And the funny thing is that the guy with visions, the CEO or whomever, CFO, already knows what the solution is. It's so simple, you do this, 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 it's done. The same in the strategy. We're not talking about the problem, we're talking, no, I think I know how to solve this problem. So keep talking about solutions. And then we go finally to operations, and operations, <laughs> they don't know what they're talking about, we should do this solution. 
Yeah? Everybody is talking about solutions. But do we know if it actually delivers the right outcome? We've tried it old school, waterfall. We have the problem definition, solution proposal, etc., etc. Yeah, and at the end we validate and we failed again. Why? We have an amazing new invention. It's called Agile. Agile going to save us. And they did. See, much shorter. <laughs> but the problem, why, well, this is the problem. <laughs> <laughs> Let me see if I can. Do you've got another one, perhaps? Don't move. Okay. So we see that we validated it. And now Agile has found the miracle solution. We're going to fail early. <laughs> yeah, we haven't reached the solution that we want, the outcome, but at least we already know that we didn't. <laughs> so we're going for the next one. We're going to do it again. <laughs> Brilliant. Yeah, so we're going to implement and validate again. And we fail again. How is this possible? And again. And again, and then I run out of screen room, so I'm stopping there, but this is the principle of Agile. We do iterations, and we fail early. And it's all based on assumptions. Already at the beginning, when we do a solution proposal, we assume that we know that what we want to build. It's going to look like this, it's going to deliver this, make it work. And actually, that problem perseveres through the whole stack. Gets probably worse and worse. And it could well be that at this point, I was talking to somebody, another speaker, said, we already knew what to do here. But we were driven. <laughs> to go this way, because somebody else, the product owner, had a brilliant idea. Yes? So assumptions, there's a problem with assumptions. I don't know if you've got this expression in Australia, that's why I didn't put it out loud. <laughs> but I think you guys are knowing what I'm talking about. It's not ideal, assumptions. And my conclusion was actually, UX is preventing us from be being customer centric. This is why I took the the back-end uh, talks, by the way, because if I said this for front-end developers, I would be in trouble. But from a back-end perspective, it's clear. And why is it clear? Because we're starting to, UX, to use UX at the beginning of the process. When we are defining the problem statement and the solution statements, we are already using UX to draw pictures so that we can talk to the people so that we understand each other. But actually, if I see a picture of a hole, I think, oh, that's small. And the other person says, oh, it's not where a square peg fill, fill in, so it's perfect, it's round. Yeah, so pictures are just creating assumptions. And then we're fighting those assumptions during the whole life cycle of the product. What's way more important, and where everybody should start, is with the outcome. And I'm not just talking about the outcome in the form of the outcome is the system that we've built, or the data that we produce. That's output. It's the result of what we've done, not what we should be doing. In reality, an outcome is something that drives changes in conditions, behavior, or attitudes ta -da, of people. I would challenge all of you to 
actually translate the current outcome that you think you have into what it would mean if it needs to be an outcome for a person that sits at the end? And are we actually creating value for the people that are our customers? Or are we delivering what they thought they would need? So my perception is that if I don't change the person using the system in a positive way, I haven't achieved anything. Why did I do it? So making a system faster, awesome, could save cost, but if the people are still not happy, what have we achieved? Nothing. So, yeah, and it needs to be positive. That's just a minor detail. <laughs> Coming back to us as a group of developers, and I definitely, I'm also pointing to myself, I'm still developing, and we have a tendency of doing linear thinking and what do I mean with linear thinking is, I have a goal, I want to drink water. I want a bucket of water, especially with this weather. So I make a decision. I buy a water pump. Genius. I'm done. And the state of the system is, I've got water. And the good thing is that everybody else is thinking, that's a brilliant guy. Well, everybody else wants water. And everybody's going to make the same decision. Oops. I no longer have water. Because everybody else is doing it too. So this shows what's missing in linear thinking. Linear thinking doesn't look at what's the impact on the context that I'm working in. So it's really, really important that when you develop something, you look at what context is this going to be used. Why? Because if I'm just doing linear thinking, I just make a decision and nothing happens, it's static. But if other people are also doing the same thing, the state of the system is influenced by both. So I have no longer control over the state of the system. And what will always happen, there will be side effects. And system thinking is about identifying side effects. That's one of the aspects. So, awesome we have found the solution to at least identify that linear thinking is not complete enough, we need something else. And as a good example, I couldn't come up with anything better than this, but it's, it's clear. When there are births, and there will be some delay, the population will grow. If there are deaths, actually, the population will decrease. So this keeps each other, influences what they call the stock in system thinking. This is influenced by both cycles. One of them is the reinvigoring cycle. It becomes bigger and bigger and bigger. And at a certain point, actually, it explodes. It, the system is no longer working. Yeah, because, uh, for instance, with births, we have too many people in town. Actually, there's no food anymore, so more people are going to die. Yeah, so there's always a natural end to this approach. Deaths are called a balancing loop. This influences in a negative way, but it balances the system. And when you build any system, you need to identify these loops. What is influencing what, in what manner? And that allows us to see the impact. That's exactly what we talked about this morning. Don't look just at the detail level. Go to that hel helicopter view. What's the impact of what I'm doing? What are the other systems that will be influenced by this? Uh. 
it's still not that easy. Yeah, there is a lot of complexity because this is a perfect model for scientists. It says everything. And for us, it will say nothing because all the detail is lost in the complexity of the thing. So system thinking is great, but same as with agile, it's all about the journey. You don't plan, you talk about the planning so that you know what to do. So agile has its use. However, what I found out, or at least what touched on me, is that I can read this differently. What I can do is say, actually, these are events. Yeah? And the interaction has an outcome. So in here, I've got two systems and I know exactly what's happening without knowing what the systems are doing. But I do know the outcome. Keep that thought. The next extremely important point from system thinking, and I heard it last year from Dana Brennemeyer, is that a system actually is not the sum of its parts. A system is the product of the interaction between parts. You don't need to know the systems. You need to know what happens when they interact with each other. And the system here can be a piece of technology or it can be a human or it can be an organization. The same principles apply. It's all about the interaction between a human and a system, sorry, a human and a piece of technology. Yeah, what it's about is, can I model, can I describe the interaction and what the outcome of the interaction is? This shows it in the picture. Interaction has happened between two systems. Something has happened event. And I actually have gathered facts from that interaction. My state has changed because of the interaction. If we look at humans, it's a little bit more complicated because the awesome thing with uh, code is, and that's probably why most of our people are being a developer, is that the same result always happens when I run a piece of code. However, if I have an interaction with a human, and I do this, and the second time I do this, and the third time I do this, and then the fourth time they will do this, there is a tolerance, apparently. <laughs> so, there is also something like, the, what are the rules of engagement? Yeah, so if you talk about human systems, then we will have to look at the rules. And very importantly, who owns the rules? Is the owner of the rules, is it one of the systems or both systems? Or is it something or someone in a system that sits around it? Yeah, this will mean do we have the ability to change the interaction? Or knowing that if we apply a different system, the outcome will stay the same because the rules don't change. And this principle has helped us actually already apply this way of thinking, of modeling things in the Netherlands with uh, somebody that does counseling. And she works with traumatized kids. And um, what she can do with this is only write down the interactions, get rid of all the names and people that are involved in those interactions, and purely work with the kid about, okay, where am I being affected? Where should we change the rules? Where are the wrong rules? Where are the wrong stakeholders? by just having a very simple picture. 
So, what's my approach? As the next step is that apparently the outcome is actually where we should be starting, not the solution. We start with defining the outcome, and we define the outcome as the change of behavior or attitude of people. Then the next step is how do we measure that we have reached that outcome, which will usually be the KPIs or the OKRs or whatever we want to call them. So we have facts in those OKRs that we can measure. The next step is how did we get the information for the OKRs, the knowledge that sit here? Something must have happened. A interaction took place that resulted in this. Simple example, subscription started. How do I know that I'm successful in selling subscriptions? It's because I've got an increase in the number of subscriptions. Um, so what I could measure is actually saying, okay, I need to know a subscription ID so that it's a unique thing and I can count the subscription IDs that I have. But I also want to know what customers or the age of the customers, I don't know. So that fact also needs to be captured. And um, before we know it, we start down the chain until we found all the knowledge points in time that gives us the knowledge to know that we've reached the outcome. And before you know it, you've got the whole model, the whole system described. All the interactions, and you can see if there are any missing links in the actual model uh, that doesn't allow you to reach the outcome. And if we then make, oh, sorry, got this slide. So again, in short, what do we need to know? Uh, sorry about this, guys. And we see all this. Next step, because I promised that I would bridge it all the way. Event-driven architecture. All right. So for me, event-driven architecture has boiled down to three very important principles. So I use CQRS, Command Query Responsible Separation. I'll explain later what it is. Event sourcing and event modeling. And the reason why I use these to implement a stack like that is that they simplify and they remove dependencies. Like in an interaction, I only want to be able to focus on one event, one interaction, and nothing else should be involved in that one. So, command query responsibility separation. What is it? It's a separation between how the command is structured, the API of the command, it's stored in whatever form, and then actually when we do a view, we want the information out of it, we use a different model. Yeah, so it breaks the dependency in the database about this model needs to be the same as that one, and they constantly, ch so if I change the command, my query will break, yeah? If I go a step further and use event sourcing, I actually get an even better separation because I write to a separate store and I only write to this store. So it gives me an immediate audit log of everything that has happened and we don't have an update command. We don't have an update, yeah? And we then use all the events, all the interactions that have taken place, we use to replay them so that a projector can say, this is the current state according to the view that I need to have. So what does that mean? If, for instance, I have a start of a trial, a command handler, and in the database I store the event this has happened. Then, if somebody 
says, okay, I want to know about this. I built a query projector and I can create a table view that will result in, yep, that ID, that email. This is the view that I need. Next, another event happens through automation and it says, okay, I've sent an email confirmation. Same thing, uh, email gets confirmed. Nothing else happens still because I already had that information. And then I've got an automation that says the trial has now started. And suddenly I've got a trial end date and a user ID. And here I have a user that's being created. All this can be in any database, in any type of database, or even just in memory. This sits in the event sourcing database and I can always use it. And these principles I've applied to event modeling. I believe Adam was here last year um, trying to explain event modeling and um, I added one or two items and I discussed it with Adam and actually he fully embraces it. What's missing in the event model are timelines because time is important. We need to know when interactions take place versus other interactions because that depends on how much knowledge we have at that point of time. And extremely important, we need to know context. Yeah, so this is an aspect from domain-driven design where we say actually it's important if we're working for customer success, we call the events different than for sales or for other departments in the organization. They have their own language. More importantly, even though it looks to be the same interaction, it's not. They have their own events. It's the interaction between sales is different from the customer success. The fact that they receive the same data doesn't mean that it's the same talk. They are two different systems that are talking to each other. So, other aspect that was sort of there, but not quite, the actors, yeah? What, which systems are taking place? And this results in the ability to start brainstorming. What events do we need? And we start at the back. So we start with subscription started as the last event that we first pick up. Then from there, we step by step are going to identify what events, what things must have happened to get to the outcome that, we looking, that we're looking for. And in this one, we also immediately need to know who owns this transaction, what state are we creating here. Yeah, so that's immediately identified, because if I say trial started, ah, trial was the subject that we were working with. So we keep going, going, and I made too many examples here, but I want it to be complete that actually all the aspects of capturing the events are there. In actually, it doesn't matter really in which order, we can just do a brainstorming session. And then when we've got all the events ready, now it's the time to then say, okay, where in time do they belong? So we put them on a timeline and we start to reorganize to make certain that they take place in the same order as we expected. And then the next step is it needs to be placed in a context. Yeah. So in this case, I only have one timeline, but there can be, of course, many timelines in one context. And you can have multiple contexts in the system talking to each other. So in this way, we have a modeling where there's no technology whatsoever, where we can just talk with our customers about what must happen. Yeah, nothing of technology. And then if we want to, we can make a next step. And that's where event modeling comes in. That's where we actually will start to identify the next step is 
how did we get the events? Yeah, so we dive into the system. I think, yep, we should be going there now. Almost time to drive. So here we actually see the event model. It can automatically generate it because we have all the information. We know the streams of events. We know the names of the events. And over here, what we're now doing is applying patterns to the event. So the first event was, hey, I want to request a trial, so I need an interface to get that information. The second is an automation, because I have information, I now need to send out an email confirmation. So the only thing that I need to do here is push a button and explain what pattern do I want to apply. And the other thing is, of course, what events are, am I dependent on? Yeah, so it could be that I need a query, like over here, trial started. I need to check that this event has taken place and this event has taken place, and only then I can give this command. Still, no technology. The only thing that's a little bit technical here is the automation. Yeah, but I see this as implementation level. This is what developers should be doing. Yeah, they need to decide what the smartest way is to get this information. And once we've all done this, it means that we can finally say, okay, uh, let me see, I'll be there, almost. So, I'm now building a query. And then, we actually don't have to do anything yet. We could press a button and we can generate code based on these patterns and we have the whole scaffolding for the whole backend in place. We could even go up and already create the scaffolding for the data sources for the front end. Uh, and we need, we know what fields we need as input in the front end, so we could even already generate the screens in any language, because the only thing that we need to know is how do we implement these patterns in that language. Yeah, so here we've achieved end-to-end implementation from where we started with we need to define the outcome, go down, go backwards, 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 and even in this picture, we keep going backwards. We start with, we have this event, how did we get it? So you always think out of the interaction, out of the event, never from the action side of things. And then your model will always be correct. So, what have we achieved here? Predictability. Because those patterns are always the same. Once we've done this a couple of times, we know that an automation will take us this much, much time. We know how much it takes to do a uh, translation of an external event to a new event. Yeah? So, we could easily do fixed price contracts again with IT. And the next step, how do we translate this in work? Each slice is a story. Why is it a story? We can independently test it. And that, for me, is the definition of a story. Do we need anything else to make this work? No. We can, the only thing that we need to do for testing is, do I get an event that contains the right information? Do I get an event that contains the right information? Yeah, and the only thing that I need to mock are the events that trigger it. So I actually have complete uh, scenario testing already in place. And on a higher level, I can immediately see this is an epic because there are dependencies with each other. You should implement an epic that completes, a start, has a clean start and a clean end not an open end, because then it's not an epic, I can't deliver it. An epic should be deliverable. And a story should be testable, and I can choose when to deliver it. So, I think with that approach, we have 
been able to have a one-on-one -on -one connection with the vision, the goal setting, etc. So what we've done here is taking the bias out of the risk part of an IT project. Yeah, we're now talking about a system where we can get everybody in agreement around the outcome. The hardest part will still be at the top. How do I know that that's the outcome that I want? And that's where we can use testing and the customer experience to see, hey guys, does it indeed make you happy when we do this and this and this? Don't talk about how. And that's the biggest mistake that often is being made, that we talk too much about, hey, say you have this screen and you can do this, this. does that solve your problem? Yes, I think. No clue. All right, thanks to all the sponsors that have made this possible that I'm here and have this talk. And I would like to thank you all and ask, are there any questions? <laughs> Thank you, Ariane. Such an insightful session. Uh, do we have any questions for Ariane? Oh, there's one here. Uh, just wondering, when it comes to event sourcing, and at some point you're going to reach a scale where you've got hundreds, thousands, millions of events, how do you deal with... Um, you know, infrastructure goes down, you start up again, you've got to get your, get your projections up to date. Do you have snapshots? So how do you deal with that sort of thing? Uh, usually, I never need snapshots because, and you will find this back in a lot of uh, talks on, on the internet, it's about how do you design the length of your streams? What's the life cycle of an instance of a trial? Yeah, make them as short as possible. Then it's not relevant. And if you look in the practice, it is how often ha do you have million events that are particular to an instance, a state of a system? Uh, yeah, state systems are not that long living. But if you do, then snapshotting would be an opportunity. Um, I use snapshots more from a migration perspective. So, um, although I'm, I'm hoping to change the f aspect because what I didn't mention is, this is also an uh, organic architecture. You don't change events uh, or how do the events are being delivered. If something changes, it is actually a new event, and it means that the old event is no longer used. But sometimes it will happen, you do a reorganization, you have two companies merging, then the terminology is not right, and that's often the biggest reason to do replays. Uh, but again, um, my personal practice and also a company I work a, a lot with in the, in the Netherlands, Exonic, they say that in reality, the replays don't need to be that long. Any other? Did I lose you all or? <laughs> <laughs>